Okay, perfect. So thanks of all, first of all for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, that's right. I want to talk to you today about the gut microbiota and the brain. And I just want to tell you now, my talk is not for the faint-hearted, okay? I need you, all your attention so you can understand the concepts that I'm going to explain to you today. So let's take you back first by one century, where Russian immunologist Eli Metchnikov lived. Now, he, was, um, he won the Nobel Prize, and he was famous for immunology. But actually, not many people know is that he uh, got interested in bacteria in the later in his life. And when he went to Bulgaria, he said, hmm, why are all these people living so long? And eventually, what he put it down to was the yogurt that they were eating. Now, it wasn't just the yogurt that they were eating, it was the bacteria in the yogurt. So he gained this idea that bacteria were beneficial for us, and he actually wrote a book about it. Now, being a good scientist, he actually put his medicine to test, and he took a, a soured milk every day, and believe it or not, he lived to the ripe old age of 71. Not bad, eh? It wasn't until 1990 where we revisited the concept of bacteria um, being helpful for us. Oops. So the gut microbiota now. What is it and what does it do? So the gut microbiota, it's a two kilogram amount of bacteria which sits within our guts. Um, it's a highly diverse community and each thing, uh, each bacteria in our guts makes us unique. It gives us a fingerprint because each gut microbiota is unique. Now what does it do? Um, it has metabolic functions, structural functions, and immunity functions. However, if we were to take a tiny little spaceship, enter our mouths, and go all the way down to our bums, it would be about seven meters in length, and would encounter 100 trillion bacteria. Yeah, that's quite a number of bacteria, right? And when we count all the number of cells in our bodies, and all the number of cells um, in our, how many cells are in our bacteria, we would find there are actually more bacteria than human. It's crazy, huh? Okay, so back to the me metabolic function. What does it do? It help, uh, the bacteria help us digest foods, which we cannot. In addition to this, they have uh, a structural function, so it helps keep our gut barrier nice and tight. In addition to this, the immunity. So 80% of our immune cells lie within our guts. And so it makes the microbiota, the bacteria in our guts, um, a key educator to our immune system. So, but as your mother probably told you, it's all about balance, it's all about moderation. And just like that, that's how it is in the gut microbiota. We need some uh, good bacteria and also some bad bacteria which educate our immune system and tell us what we need to attack. So what the good bacteria do, they do crowd control of all the bad bacteria, yeah? And this is giving a happy, healthy environment for us and makes us happy and healthy too. However, when the unlikely situation, or likely situation, when the bad bacteria overpopulate all the good bacteria, this is when problems arise. This is when we have diseases. And we have diseases in the gut, such as irritable bowel syndrome, inflammatory bowel disease, and also diseases away from our gut, such as eczema, asthma, and mood changes. Yeah, mood changes. Where do moods originate? in our brains. So now scientists are starting to look at the connection between the gut microbiota and the brain. However, as I uh, do my PhD at the Institute of Stroke and Dementia Research, I want to talk to you today about the gut microbiota influencing the brain. So in order for you to do this, I need you to first close your eyes. That's close your eyes, not fall asleep, all right? Um, so just picture this scenario, okay? It's the end of the day, it's about 6 p.m. and you're just following up some emails. All of a sudden you have a weakness, or you could have a weakness in the side of your face, arm, or legs. And you're thinking, whoa, this is a weird feeling. And you want to tell your colleagues, so you try and get up, you try and tell them with your voice, and you try and make eye contact with them. However, you start to, you have fumbling with your words, and your vision is somehow blurred, and you feel very unbalanced. So guys, open your eyes again. These are the symptoms what you experience when you're having a stroke. And if you ever experience this or see anyone experience this, please call an ambulance within five minutes. Okay, so what's going on in our brains during this time? Here's a nice <laughs> depiction of our brain. Um, and it's nicely vascularized with vessels. But what are vessels? Vessels are tubes which carry blood. And in the blood contains oxygen and nutrients. And what it does is it 
supplies blood to our brains and keeps our tissue working and functioning properly. But what happens when we have sort of a blood clot or a blockage of our vessels? So what happens is the tissue cannot get its healthy oxygen and nutrients and therefore starts to die. And that's essentially a stroke. Now just a little bit about the numbers here. So stroke is the second cause of death worldwide. And in 2015, the World Health Organization said 50 million people died from stroke. Yeah, you know, there's only one drug which we can give in the clinic. It's funny, huh? And there's another catch. We have to give it within 4.5 hours. So this is why we think, hmm, maybe the microbiota could be helpful to us. And this is what we're looking at in Aga Lee's lab at the Institute of Stroke and Dementia Research. So in order to tell you a little bit about what's going on, we're going to have to enter the lab, I'm afraid. Um, and I need to get on my protection. Ugh. You know, because it's going to be some messy stuff with mice poop everywhere. Okay, so the first question is, how does the stroke affect the gut microbiota? So, here we have some mice. So we have the healthy mouse with the normal purple gut microbiota, nice and healthy, see? And we have a mouse who's had a stroke, a different color, so a different gut microbiota. And what we did is we counted all the different species within the gut. And we found, actually, that the mouse who'd had a stroke had a decrease in bacterial diversity, so had a less diverse gut microbiome. But before, they were exactly the same. So this was telling us that the stroke is changing the gut microbiota. So this is the first question answered. Next. The next experiment, before I go on, I have to explain to you this little guy here. So this is a germ-free mouse or a microbiota-free mouse. And what's cool about these guys is because they've never encountered a bacterial species in their lives. So they're a little bit strange. They always, um, they feed in a sterile environment, they drink water in a sterile environment, they were born in a sterile environment. And so they don't have a gut microbiota, like the nice healthy purple gut microbiota the, the normal mouse has. Now what we can do with the germ-free mouse is we can give it back a gut microbiota, we can put back a gut microbiota. And we can do this from different diseases, like mouse with obesity, a mouse who has asthma, and we can see how the gut microbiota can change the rest of the body as well. So this is, of course, what we did without a stroke. So here we are again, back with the normal mouse with the normal purple gut microbiota and the mouse who's had a stroke. We took a little bit of their gut microbiota, so we isolated it, and then we gave it back to the germ-free mouse. So again, here we have the germ-free mouse with a normal gut microbiota, and we have a germ-free mouse with a stroke gut microbiota. And then they had a stroke. So you guys, yeah, you look pretty intelligent. This is where I'm going to ask you a question. So as scientists, what we like to do is we like to measure the amount of cell death in the brain. And this is how uh, one indicator we say how bad the stroke is. So who thinks the mouse with the normal gut microbiota had a bigger stroke? Please put your hands up now. One guy, brave. Um, who thinks the mouse with a stroke gut microbiota had a larger stroke? Please put your hands up. Yeah, see, I knew it. You are a smart audience. And you're right, because the mouse who had the normal gut microbiota had a smaller stroke in compared to the mouse who had a stroke donor, showing us that, in fact, we can change the gut microbiota and affect brain disease. So now you're saying, OK, this is cool, Becky, yes, but what are the mechanisms that are going on here? And as I said before, I wasn't lying. This is really forefront research. We did these experiments last year. So we only have maybe three potential mechanisms which we can explore, which we can reason, uh, reason why the gut affects the brain. And I just want to go over them really quickly now. So the first way the gut microbiota can affect the brain is by physical, so direct connection from the brain to the gut. The next one, biochemical. So as we said before, our bacteria are somehow little factories producing many chemicals which can enter our bloodstream and change our brains. Another one, the immune system. So our immune system is changing due to our gut microbiota. And this can then go into the brain too. So let's go into a bit detail. So the first mechanism, nerves. So as this special nerve, the vagus nerve, connects directly from the brain to the gut. And if we just zoom in here, we can see, so the gut microbiota can produce chemicals or it can directly tickle the uh, vagus nerve here and send signals back up to the brain. 
Now, we know this is a way because we found, well, scientists have found one particular species which can actually improve the symptoms of depression. However, when we cut this nerve, these symptoms are not improved with this bacteria anymore, showing us that the gut microbiota communicates with the brain via this nerve. Okay, the next mechanism is bacteria can produce chemicals. So as we said, they can digest foods which we cannot and produce vitamins and short chain fatty acids, but they can also produce neurotransmitters. Now neurotransmitters are the chemicals used which neurons communicate with each other. So two neurotransmitters, uh, serotonin, our feel good neurotransmitter, 90% is made in the gut actually. Dopamine, our reward neurotransmitter, 50% is made in the gut. And the gut microbiota can make many different other neurotransmitters which go into the bloodstream and affect the way our neurons communicate with, with each other. Okay, another mechanism in which the gut microbiota can affect the stroke is the immune system. And as we said, in the immune, 80% uh, of our immune cells reside in our guts. Now, depending on what type of bacteria we have in our guts also changes the balance of immune cells we have in our guts as well. So if we have an aggressive or if we have bad gut microbiota, we can produce a more aggressive immune response, aggr aggressive immune cells. Whereas if we have more good bacteria, we can have more calming and chilled um, immune response. So we had this in mind when we did our experiments and we looked at stroke. So we go back here and we look at the mouse who's had a stroke and who's had a normal gut microbiota or a stroke donor gut microbiota. And we looked at the balance of the aggressive immune cells versus the calming immune cells inside the gut. And guess what we found? We found more aggressive immune cells in the guts of these mice who's had uh, a stroke donor in compared to the normal donor. In addition, we looked in the brain and believe it or not, again, we found more aggressive immune cells in the brains of the mouse um, compared to the normal donor in the stroke. Okay. Um, and this is one reason why we think the stroke is bigger in the stroke mice compared to the normal donor. Okay, so usually we're picking foods. Now I can take this off. <laughs> usually we're eating foods which we think, oh, what can we eat to make us look more skinny and sexy? But maybe we should start thinking about what we can eat to make our gut microbiota help happy and healthy. So. What can we do to support a gut microbiome? So I'm just gonna talk to you briefly about biotics. So biotics simply means life. So pre-life, pro-life, and anti-life. Prebiotics, what are they? These are like fruits and vegetables, um, like dietary fibers and legumes, which you can eat, which is also found in this famous Mediterranean diet, which everyone should eat. Um, and what they do is they, they're like food for our good bacteria, and they encourage a healthy, good bacteria compared to a bad bacteria gut microbiome. Another way in which we can support a healthy gut microbiome is by drinking kefir and yakult. What's so good about them? They contain live bacteria. And instead of encouraged, uh, encouraging the growth of good bacteria, we simply add more bacteria into our good microbiome. And another way we can change our gut microbiome is taking antibiotics. Now, the good thing about antibiotics is it kills the bad bacteria, but you're also wiping out all the good bacteria as well. And maybe we're all a little bit guilty of taking antibiotics when it wasn't necessary. So, yeah. And with that, I would already like to say thank you for your time. You've been a great audience. Thank you to the beautiful and intelligent 15 by 4 team for spending time with me. And also, if you'd like, uh, like what you've heard and you're very interested, please follow our lab, the Lee's Lab, on um, Twitter. And we also have a very hard lab meeting every year. <laughs> and thank you very much for your time, finally. So now... So now we have some time for questions. So I'm going to repeat the questions in order to everyone for to everyone to hear it. So please, someone has a question, please. How do you induce the stroke in the mice? So the question is how you induce stroke in the mice. Okay. 
That's a very particular question. Um, we can do it many ways, actually. Um, so that at the moment, we use three different ones. So it's typically doing surgery, and you're taking the medial cerebral artery, and you're occluding this artery. Poor animal. Okay. So <laughs> any other questions? Um, could, you, could you define the aggressive and the chills of like a little bit more precisely? Oh so yeah, that's the my favorite the part. The question is, <laughs> uh, how you define aggressive and chill bacteria? Um, so aggressive bacteria sort of encouraging an inflammatory response. So more specifically, Th17 cells or IL-17 or inf interferon gamma or things along these lines. And a calming immune response is somehow dampening an already an aggressive inflammatory state. So it's sort of anti-inflammatory, such as T-regulatory cells, for example. Please. Hi. Um, do you think your upbringing is also important whether you have a good microbiota or not? Uh, because when you're a child, you're probably, especially in Western world, if you compare Western world with Eastern world, Eastern world is more, they go outside, they, there's dirt everywhere, well, not everywhere, but in some countries, <laughs> sure. Uh, and in my experience, people from Eastern world seem to have a better immune system compared to people from Western world, even though life expectancy is more high in Western world compared to Eastern world. So essentially the question is, if your childhood experience when you're exposed to microbes uh, affecting your immune system? Well, actually, yeah, you're right. So the gut microbiota can change from many things. For example, our environments, our diets, our medication, our environment, many things can change the gut microbiota. So yes, you will start to see changes in the immune responses. And also, as you're a child, you're exposed to different types of diseases, and you're going to develop an immunity when you're young to different thought, uh, sort of things. And it, maybe the hygiene hypothesis is old-fashioned, but it also could be true. Um, so yeah, I think it's good for kids to get out in the dirt and get exposed to all the different stuff that they possibly can, and even travel to different places now that we can. Um, so yeah, you're right, yeah. This is just a lot of fun. So w we have uh, time for one last question, please. <coughs> so you said uh, that um, the proper eating like vegetables mm -hmm. helps. So have you noticed the difference if somebody eats meat or how does meat attack the bacteria <laughs> like your gut? So the question is if the meat diet affecting your gut microbiota. Well, yes, it does change the gut microbiota. And so far, um, Protein has not been shown to be um, beneficial in terms of, um, I mean, probiotics are the best type of uh, to probiotics to grow the good bacteria. Somehow meat was not associated, I mean, it supports a gut microbiota, but it's not been associated with an improvement of symptoms, for example. This would be. So I think uh, we should say thank you to Becky. Thank and you. Please.